Good evening and welcome to um, Holdwell's October 3 Book Friday. Um, I'm Nick Triplo and along with my colleague uh, Nick Quantrill, uh, we'll be asking our guests to choose the three books that have most influenced them as writers and readers and discuss what makes them must read. So we'll be asking um, for a book that's um, that they uh, that um, was given to them, a book that they would give to somebody else or recommend and a book that's influenced their writing in some way. So uh, please like and subscribe the video as we go along. And if you want to get involved with the discussion on social media, please um, please do that. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Nick. Thank you very much. So yes, we're back again, another Three Book Friday. So to introduce our two guests to you very quickly, uh, Darren underneath me is Abhiya Mukherjee. Uh, he's the author of the Windham and Banerjee series of crime novels set in Raj era India. Uh, his books have won numerous awards now, including the CWA Dagger for Best Historical Novel and the latest one, The Shadows and Menace, published 11th of November. Uh, and then diagonally opposite, underneath me is uh, Marion Todd. Uh, she's the author of the D.I. Claire Mackay series of crime novels and was shortlisted for the Bloody Scotland Scottish Crime Debut of the Year Award. The, the latest in the series, Next in Line, is published this month. So two fantastic new books out. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first category then, a favourite book that he was given. So we'll go alphabetically. So we'll go with you, Abia, and you've chosen. You know, I thought you were going to go for Marion first. I thought, I thought that would give me a bit of time. Um, <laughs> I'm, going to start, I'm going to start with a book that was given to me by a girlfriend uh, who then became my fiance and is now my wife. Uh, so it's a very special book to me, you know, and uh, it, is, it is a fantastic book. It is The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. Um, now, you know, Jhumpa Lahiri is one of the most brilliant authors of, of her generation. She's won, she's won everything, you know, including the Pulitzer Prize and the Hemingway Awards. Um, and The Namesake probably isn't her most well-known work, but it is by far, for me, it's, it is a favourite. Uh, it's the story of a Bengali, a Hindu Bengali family from Calcutta that emigrates to the United States. Um, it's, it's two people, it's Ashok and Ashima Ganguly, and they emigrate to the States uh, where they have a kid, well, they have two kids, in fact. Uh, the elder one is called Gogol, um, because Bengalis are like that. We tend to name our kids after Russians for some reason, <laughs> Russian heroes. We're, we're very cultured people. Um, but the book is, is really, it's about the story of this immigrant family to America, leaving India, leaving all the cultural certainties. It's about a father who's willing to move forward whilst the mother is still sort of restrained by her culture. And it's about the kids growing up with this dual identity. It's, it's about the clash of cultures. It's about conflicts and assimilation and the tangled ties between the generations. Um, now, you might guess why this appeals to me, because it, you know, I read this and no book had ever touched me in the way that this book did. You know, I, I was reading this and the family was my family. The, the, the mannerisms of the father were the mannerisms of my father. You know, they left the same city. My parents came to Britain as opposed to America, but there was so much in this that I would, I would read and think I was reading about my own family. And, they, they, you know, people talk about, there's a book out there that speaks to you. Now, this was the first book that really spoke to me um, you know, there, there are very few novels that I have read in my life. Well, there are very few novels that talk about people with my sort of experience, that immigrant experience from India, especially one of, you know, my culture as well, the Hindu Bengali culture. And to me, it was an exceptionally special book. So I had to marry this girl in the end, you know, because of this book. Um, <laughs> that's a wise <laughs> yeah. Is it a book that's influenced your own writing as well in some way? Because there's a sense in there that maybe Gurgle is out of place where he, when, you know, when, when he moves to America, is maybe a, a man out of place, possibly a bit like Wyndham, possibly in the series. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to say it did, but I don't think I could, I can claim to have been influenced. You know, if, if I've been influenced by Jhumpa Lahiri, then, you know, I think it's, she should have done a better job of influencing me because she's <laughs> such a better writer than me. So I would, I wouldn't claim that there, I mean, obviously there are things that she discusses there in the books, which, you know, themes which I touch on in my writing and which I'm going to touch on more um, going forward. But, but this idea of outsiders, um, people outside of a community that they understand or, or, or 
let's call it cultural schizophrenia, you know, stuck between two different cultures. Um, that's something which is very special, something very close to my writing. Um, and, and I think I just wish I could do it a fraction as well as she does. Really? Is, it a, is she a novelist you're familiar with, Marion? Have you come across her work? No. Uh, so I, I had a, a very quick look today um, online and I could have sat there all day reading um, this book. It's just beautifully written, just absolutely glorious prose. And the, the, the kind of experience, the first bit I read was um, the bit of uh, Gogol's wife in labour. Mm-hmm. And, and I just thought, oh, it was just so well done, so beautifully written. You just felt her her discomfort, her, her kind of, uh, sorry, not Gogol's wife, Gogol's mother. Yeah, I'm I sure, yeah, I um, I sure, Yes, uh, you just felt her completely out of place and, and, and not really, you know, obviously having a baby for the first time is, is a new experience for anyone, but she was in this completely different culture and it was, you just felt her utter discomfort. I, I just loved the, the sound of it. It's definitely one I have to read. Yeah, I didn't explain to you, did I? I recommend it. Yeah, when, when you come to um, Free Book Friday, it's a very expensive occasion because you will end all the Yes, I, I'm getting that. I'm getting that. <laughs> so the book you chose, Marion, as a favourite book, it was um, it's quite a niche one, I think, isn't it? It's called um, yeah. Ben Gorm John, A Life in Mountain Rescue it is. by John Allen. So I have it here. Yeah. Book, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have you read it, Abir? I haven't. I haven't, oh. but it is now on my list. Right. Well, it was given to me by my son, my middle child, my son, Ewan. Um, When the children were young, I decided for whatever reason that I really wanted them to be able to go into the mountains and walk and navigate and and, um, enjoy Scotland. And I was bringing them up myself. So I thought, right, it's down to me. Um, So absolutely clueless. I I had a house full of Ordnance Survey maps, but um, that was about it. So I taught myself um, how to use a compass and read a map and navigate and all the rest of it. Then I taught the kids and we started taking a holiday once a year in Perthshire, where there's some lovely, nice, easy hills, not kind of scary, jagged rocks and things. And we started off with kind of glen walks and, and so on and so on. And then we started going up mountains. Um, and now I did choose nice, easy ones, but um, I was absolutely paranoid that I was going to have to call out the mountain rescue. It was, it was just my big dread. I could see myself on the evening news with these big hairy men talking about a woman in bairns out on the mountains and disgrace and all the rest of it. So I, we did it belt and braces. We, we carried emergency rations. I mean, I was going up tourist paths. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But we carried extra rations, waterproofs, extra clothes. And I used to leave a big note in the car um, sort of big, big A4 sheet and magic marker saying where we were going, what time we'd left, what time we would be back, and um, the colour of our anoraks, so that if they did have you know to bring the helicopter out, they'd spot us. <laughs> Just ridiculous. <laughs> where, and, where would you leave the sign? Would that be in the window of the car? Yeah, or? yeah, on the dashboard. You know, so, so somebody said to me, "What a way to get your car stolen!" Telling them you're away for four hours. <laughs> but I thought I'd rather have the car stolen than than have the this you know kind of the scathing looks of the the big hairy men. So um, years later, um, my middle son Ewan has gone on to be quite a. a quite a scary mountaineer he did kind of rock climbing and stuff like that so job done there the other two couldn't care less but he bought me this book and he said this is to remind you of all the times you were afraid that the hairy men were going to have to come in and um, it's just the most marvelous book now it's not a crime novel it's not even fiction each chapter is uh, can be read discreetly you can dip in and out um, most of the chapters will deal with a particular rescue some that end well and some that end less well and some of them I actually remember from the news because you know you're always aware of these things happening in Scotland um, and you can dip in and out of it and it's it's a fabulous palate cleanser when your head's full of book but what it also um, does for me as a writer is it takes me into the Cairngorms, where I've walked with the children and lots of the places where we went, these accidents or, or these kind of missing people would happen. But it also um, is almost like a kind of crime novel in, it, in itself, in each individual chapter, because while I'm writing about who done it and why done it, um, this is where done it, because the mountain rescue team 
have to work out where someone is and it's not as straightforward as you think you know even my note in the car I might have said I'm going up Ben whatever and I'm taking the tourist path but the cloud comes down and you know if you hill walk at all you you will get caught out by the weather um the, the trick is to be prepared and to, to just keep looking behind you because it can change in a flash um and we don't walk in straight lines and we don't you know, I, I, there was one time when I climbed um, up one of the easiest, shortest walks in Scotland up to Loch Brandy, which is off Glen Clover. And we got to the top, saw the loch, and then the mist came down. And I went to head off to go back down and went in completely the wrong direction. Now, you can't miss the path at Loch Brandy. So you, you kind of, you become disorientated and you're maybe, they're maybe taking their instructions from someone who's left an injured walker and they've come down and they're telling them I've left them on this path but they might be suffering from a degree of hypothermia themselves so the the mountain rescue um team have a puzzle to solve um they have to try and put themselves in the shoes of the walkers and think where was the last known point where might they have gone where might they be sheltering and things like that and and just reading it and working hearing what they do or reading rather what they, they do and how they work this out and what they do then because they'll quite often find someone who's down a hole with a broken leg and you can't just hoist them up because you might cripple them for life um or you might kill them um and, and it's just oh, absolutely it, pardon have you used this stuff in a book yet it, uh, uh no, no, I haven't. You should, you should. Why not? not? Yeah. Well, you, uh, there's a Scot fabulous Scottish crime writer, one of the founders of Bloody Scotland, a lady by the name of Lynn Anderson, mm -hmm. and I'm very well organised here. This book, <laughs> Follow the Dead, actually takes place in the Cairngorms um, uh, on some of the routes that I've walked with, with the children. But I feel that I don't know it quite well enough mm -hmm. Um and it's not St Andrews, which is where my books are set. Yeah. Uh, it's a long way from the hills. But, yeah, some of the, the forensic information, that the, the, how they set about things like that, is stored away. Yeah, it's, it, oh, it's a lovely read. And as I say, for a writer, it's a fabulous palate cleanser. You can dip into a chapter and then dip out again. Fantastic. Right. I, I, have some, a, I have a couple of questions. I've got a couple of questions for Marion. Other than making me look bad by having all your props here, um, that's the first thing to say. But um, see my um, OS maps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, said, you said you started on easy mountains. Now, what what's an easy mountain? And then did you graduate? Um, ish. Uh, an easy mountain, I would say. The first one I took the children up was Ben Glass which you uh, access from, it's, it's actually in front of Ben Laws, which is quite a high one. I think it's about the 10th or the 11th highest Monroe in Scotland. But Ben Glass in front of it is a bit lower and there's a very straightforward tourist path. And the wonderful thing is you start at something like, oh gosh, I don't know, 600 metres or something. It's, it's, so you're starting, you, the approach road goes up like sort of that. And then there's a car park and there's a kind of path all the way. And it's such a popular mountain that you see people coming up and down. But that was actually the worst day that we've ever, ever done because there was sideways rain. But it was the only day we had to do it um, because the rest of the week was just foul. And I could actually feel my daughter was only seven at the time and I could feel her. I was holding on to her, her legs getting lifted with the wind. Um, so and we got was to the that was the best day. <laughs> that's the day we have to do it. The, the rain's horizontal, but you know, that's the best. I don't want to go to anywhere. I don't want to live on a mountain, I don't think, anymore. So let, let's move on to the second question, Nick, before I, uh, <laughs> before I move into a mountain or something crazy. Was well, there a pub at the top of it, though? That's a question. Uh, there's not. There's, there's really not. So I don't know what that's about. Pointless. Um, that sounds amazing. Incredible kind of selling of a book and an incredible sense of the landscape conspiring against people. And I mean, yes. uh, I'm dying admiration for rescue services and oh, mountaineering and, and the RNLI. Just, they yeah. just do an absolutely phenomenal job. Um, they never go out in a good day. It's no, always the no, worst of weather and everything. No, and, I th and I think, um, yeah, just that kind of sense of the landscape. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Abir, your your second choice of a book that you'd pass on or gift to others is a, a kind of a gargantuan of um, literature. 
Well, yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's a bit by Vikram Seth, but it's not it's not the obvious choice. It's not a suitable boy. Um, that's the first thing to say. And it's it's a much more, um, you know, it, it's much easier to read. It's much shorter. It's a, a good 300, 400 pages, this one. Um, and it's called An Equal Music. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read it. I had a quick look again this morning. Yeah. Um, just... Well, I'll, I'll tell you why I love this book, because I'm I'm a sentimentalist at heart, and, and I much prefer this to any other of his writing. It's a book about love. It's a book about almost first love and first love lost, and then found again after 10 years or almost found again. And I think we've all had that. We've all had that, you know, this, this great love early in our lives, and we've always thought, well, what if... And then in this book, you know, you have you have two two characters. You've got a man called Michael who is um, he's a music student, um, and he I think he plays a violin, um, and he's he's very very good. And he 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 goes to Vienna um, to learn the violin at the feet of one of the great masters, uh, where he meets and falls in love with a woman called Julia, um, and their relationship blossoms, but under the pressure of his you know his violin instructor he's very good but he's just not good enough to be you know world class um and under the the, the stress and the strain of, of not being just good enough uh he leaves he leaves vienna and he leaves julia um without warning um and when he tries to contact her again after a couple of months he gets no reply um in the meantime he's moved to london and then 10 years later, um, it's one of those sliding doors moments. He's, he's on a bus and he sees her outside um, and um, he, he chases after her and he, he meets her again. But by this time, she's married. She has a kid. Um, she's married to an American banker. Can you believe that? Living in London. Um, but she has this autoimmune disease where she's gradually losing her hearing. Um, but both of them are drawn to each other again, and they're drawn to that period of their lives when they were together, that period in Vienna. Um, and, and, you know, they, they can't resist that power of the past and they begin to see each other again. But this time, you know, under the shadow of her marriage and what's happening to her hearing, um, she agrees to tour Vienna and Venice with him, um, him and his string quartet. And, you know, for a wee while, it looks like the whole world is, is, is going to be set right. Um, I'm not going to spoil it. All I will say is that, you know, things are never that easy. Um, but it, it is a it's a beautiful book. The language, as you would expect, is, is just so impassioned um, and dramatic. And, and again, you've got this set against these, the backdrop of Venice, Vienna, London and Venice, you know, it's, it's, it's this, it's this great canvas and it's these two wonderful characters. And if you told me that I would fall in love with a book about music or about uh, musicians, I would never have believed you. Again, it's not a crime novel. It's not what I would normally read, but it is, it's wonderful. It, you know, it, we have the themes of loss, of longing and music and it, it gave me an appreciation for music that I never had before into the intricacies of playing music I, I would have thought this would have been boring to me but he he creates such a moving story um and it's such a passionate story that you know it, there's something that I think in it that appeals not just to me but to anybody who's loved and maybe lost and thought what if I mean I've, again I sort of read the first few pages online and it, it left me kind of a bit homesick for London and it just has that incredible ability to, to create a place and make you feel it almost. And London this time of year, or, or London parks are just quite special, magical places. And it just was one of those incredibly sort of visual and sense provoking things that drew you in have, have you read it Marion have you read no but like you I had a look this morning and um I you know I, I used to teach piano um and I was just absolutely drawn in um reading the scene where and and, and that that bit where, where he says you know you're just playing one note after another you know try and feel it 
and, and that really resonated. I thought, oh gosh, yes, this person knows how to how to write about art. And yeah. um, it, oh, I thought it was beautiful. And obviously, sort of writing about music. Yes. A, a, yeah. a form that completely does not necessarily, well, doesn't lend itself to the page necessarily. No. No, right. and yet, yet it, yeah, did. Exactly. it it leapt off the page. It really yeah. did, and you didn't. You don't have to know. I was sort of thinking, well, yes, I know that piece. I know that piece. You don't have to, not at all, yeah. because the yeah. way that he writes it, it's it's so accessible, but it's also bewitching. Yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a luddite. When it comes to music, I know very very little, and you know it was accessible to me, and yes. it's there's such a gift in being able to write a book like that. Yeah, Marion, your choice. Um, so another book that I haven't read, I'm afraid. So, do you want to tell us about it? Your uh, the okay. Book you would so, pass on. Um, the book I would I would give to people for funsies is Louise Candlish, Those People, ah. and I, I read this quite recently. I actually heard it as an audio book first of all. It was beautifully read by Tuppence Middleton. Um, it's the story of what happens in a, a very nice, cosy middle-class street where everyone behaves and conforms and they have their norms and their rules. And the house that's been unoccupied for a while is has been inherited by a couple from the wrong side of town, Darren and Jodie. <coughs> and they set about being, by anybody's standards, pretty antisocial, but by this street's standards, hugely antisocial. And right at the beginning of the book, um, there's a one-sided police interview kind of conversation as though it's taking place on the telephone and you're just hearing the side of the, the, the person from the street. And these little half interviews pepper the book throughout. And you realise straight away with the opening interview that something has happened, but you don't know what it is. And then it goes to a chapter um, which is headed up with the name of one of the, the sort of middle-class resident characters. And it starts eight weeks before whatever has happened. And as the book goes on with a different um, character having the point of view of each chapter, um, you realise that you're getting closer and closer. So it's eight weeks before, seven weeks before, six weeks before. And you hit the incident at the midpoint of the book. Right. And thereafter, it's the fallout. Um, again, peppered with these, these um, one-sided police interviews and the points of view of all of the characters. Um, and gradually you, you realise by the midpoint what's happened. That's one of only two things that's going to happen in the book. And you're trying to work that out when suddenly the second thing happens. And she wrong foots you so beautifully. And what I admire and um, wish with all my heart that I could do is her characterization, Because there are four couples and one single person, one divorced woman in the book, the three middle-class couples and the, the kind of couple who move in and she manages to make them all distinct and to have their own voice and I think that's that's to do that with nine main characters is really quite something and the other thing about it is that you you kind of start off thinking the middle class people are the ones who are being threatened and and um having the their life disrupted which indeed they are um and that the other couple are the baddies uh, if you like and um, actually she makes you see all the points of view even though the behavior that's going on in, in all quarters is not not what you would you would expect and she pushes them and pushes them and pushes them and they all crack in their own different ways and, and it's it's just like it's like watching a, a car crash but in human form um, very slowly and inexorably it's it's a great read Sounds absolutely compelling. Really, really good. Yeah, I feel like I need to read that one. I need to read yeah. it. It's on my you list. Do, so. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So the third category is a book that's influenced your own writing. So this is always an interesting one, I think. So Abia, you've gone for another giant of literature, haven't you? Martin Amis and London Fields. So explain yes. the link between Martin Amis to your your current series. Well, <laughs> it, it's less to do with my current series and and more to do with the power of language. Now, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't. Uh, these days, I read much more for language and beauty of language than I do for plot. I don't know if any of you found that. Um, so, so what really gets me hooked on a book is something 
that does something special with the English language. Now, my Martin Amos can rub a lot of people up the wrong way. And this book is, it's a very Marmite book. You either love it or you hate it. It is his attempt at a crime novel. Um, and, you know, for me, and I'll come to why I love it, but let me tell you a wee bit about the book first. So it, it's set in, in 1999, uh, just before the, the end of the last millennium, it's set in London, um, and there's some unnamed world crisis going on. Um, and it's about a, a woman called Nicola Six, who's trying to get herself killed. She's trying to orchestrate her own death. Um, it, it, the book is about death, really. I mean, it's about the death of this woman. It's about the death of this, the, the millennium, the death of society that he lives in. And, and the narrator uh, is an American guy who's also dying of cancer. Um, and, and Nicola is this sort of black hole of sex and self-loathing. And, and she's, she, she's just filled with this ennui. She just wants to kill herself. Um, all that you, you know, and from the beginning, you know this and you know she's going to die. All that's in doubt is the identity of, of the killer. Um, and then there's two, two um, main suspects. And, and I think this is uh, quite similar to, to Louise Candlish's book that Marion mentioned. There are two people from very different social classes. There's the, the yobbish Keith Talent, who's um, he's a petty criminal. He's a cheat, but he's a darts fanatic as well. And then there's this guy, Clinch, who's rich, good looking, but very, very ineffectual. Um, and then you've got this third person, this, this narrator, this American called Samson Young, who's dying um, of cancer. Um, and so in the opening scene, you know what's going to happen. She knows she's going to get killed. She knows where and when, but she doesn't know who's going to do it. Um, and the rest of the book is really just plotting the trajectory of her journey towards annihilation. Um, it is, it's a frustrating book, but it's brilliant as well because it keeps you off balance. Um, it's 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 odd in that there is not a single likable character in 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 the book, as far as I can tell. They're all disagreeable. Um, and again, I think that's similar to what you were describing in in Louise's book. You never know who to root for. Um, but what struck me and what I loved about the book is his use of language. Um, you know, there, there were so many points where I would read it and I would just think, this is beautiful. I wish I could write like this. Um, whether it's description, whether it's characterization, um, it was just, it was, it was different to anything that I had read up to that point uh, that was ostensibly a crime novel. Um, you know, the, the characterization of people like, um, um, Guy Clinch and Keith Ta Keith Talent especially is one I think one of the the great comic characters of you know twentieth century fiction shall we say he, he, I mean, he's he's brilliant he is he is pretty much eighties man you, you can you can picture him so well um, he, he would be played by um, what's his name Philip Glenister is that the guy oh, you yeah, can just yeah, yeah. picture Philip Glenister playing Keith Talent. Um, but it, it's for me what what stood out, as I say, is the use uh, of language and the beauty um, that he puts it to. And and so for me, at least from the book I wrote after I read this, at least some of it had rubbed off. You know, I was trying things. <laughs> I don't know if the subsequent books have, because I may have just forgotten. But I do remember going through this period after reading this book, going. It's opening doors, it's opening vistas for me. I, I'm going to try and do that. And there are a couple of chapters in one of the books I'm particularly proud of, which I wrote immediately after uh, having read that. So um, I'm, I think it's, my, my standards have slipped again. Uh, I, I want to read the book just for Keith Talent alone. Oh, you know? it's, oh, it's I mean, brilliant I need, names. I yeah, I need, to, I need to meet Keith Talent, I think. That's fantastic. You would love Keith Talent. Excellent. So, Marion, you've also chosen another giant of literature, haven't you? And another kind of I have, yeah. Team. Kate Atkinson, right. One Good Turn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the novel that made me want to write crime and, and made me actually decide to write crime because I, you know, footed around thinking, oh, will I write this? Will I write that? And I, I, I read this book and I thought, yeah, that's actually what I want to do. It's the story of, um, well, it's the story of so much. It's, it's about seven or eight different stories that all converge. Um, it opens with a road rage incident during the Edinburgh Festival with a queue of people waiting to get into a venue and somebody 
shunts somebody else from behind in the car and the guy behind gets out with a baseball bat and sets about this character. And we don't know who he is, but we know that he's using a pseudonym and he's felled. And someone else who's in the crowd has his laptop with him and hits out with a laptop and in turn quite accidentally fells the baseball bat guy. And from there, the whole thing just takes off. And there are two women in the queue. One of them's called Gloria. And Gloria is married to this most disgustingly vile, awful man called Graham Hatter, who's a self-made millionaire. He's built crappy houses that fall down. And in fact, the police officer who's investigating the various things that go on um, lives in one of his houses. And, and part of the running theme is what's the cracks that are appearing in her house as the book goes on. And it introduces, um, well, it doesn't introduce, uh, has the character Jackson Brody, who is her uh, kind of protagonist. But, but really, Jackson only appears in about a fifth of the book because it keeps going between different points of view, different characters. And you think to yourself, I don't really understand what's going on here. And gradually, gradually, it's like a funnel, the, everything coming together um, you realise how they all knit together. There's not a wasted paragraph or there's nothing there that doesn't need to be there. And the ending, I just thought, that's brilliant. That's really clever. I did not see that coming. Which is always good, isn't it? If you can fool it, if you as a writer, that's not bad. Have, have you ever oh. been acting to be a... Not really any of her work. I feel really right. bad coming on here and really embarrassed. That, well, me uh, too. I mean, I've not oh, read yours. <laughs> we're all in the same boat, aren't we? <laughs> I suppose that's the great thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we're, we're going away from this, and we have we have our next three books to read. Yes, and I have do. I have I have several mountains to climb as well, starting with easy ones. <laughs> I've got to go. Yeah. What are you reading at the moment, both? Anything particularly taking your fancy? What am I reading? I'm reading an advanced copy of um, Emma Christie, who was uh, shortlisted for the Bloody Scotland debut and the she was longlisted for the McIlvany. I have an advanced copy of her next book, which is called Find Her First. I just started that last night, so I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And when's that one in the shop, Do you know? Oh, next year, I think. Next year, right. Um, it's, it, this is a very advanced copy. So that's say the Christmas book tokens one, isn't it, then? Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Abir? What are you reading at the moment? I am reading, uh, again, it's an advanced copy of a book called The Clockwork Girl by Anna Mazzola. Um, and it's fabulous. It's set uh, in, I think, uh, 17th century Paris, um, and it or 17th or 18th century Paris. And it features um, a girl who's sent to work in the home of a man who makes automatons. Um, and it's quite gothic, but the writing is... The thing about Anna, I don't know if you, if you know Anna, Anna is probably the funniest person you'll see on Twitter. She's just, you know, brilliant on Twitter. Um, to find that her writing is so sublime makes me sick because she just, you know, she's wittier, <laughs> she's more talented, and her stories are better than mine. So, um, yeah, I'm loving it, loving it. And that comes out in January, I believe. Right, fantastic. What are you, Nick? How are you reading at the moment? I'm reading this, actually. Sergeant Salinger. Wow, yeah. Which is um, Jerome Cherin's novel about J.D. Salinger's wartime experiences. Obviously, you know, the whole thing with Salinger is you don't really know a lot about him in terms of his biography, but this takes him through. Um, he was an intelligence officer based in England and then went out with um, the, the invasion force. And his, um, I mean, what sparked it is his short story for Esme with Love and Squalor, which, and if you haven't read it, it's, I guess it's one of my favourite short stories, but a lot of it is sort of based around um, his own experiences of, of going through Europe with the um, the American forces. Brilliant, absolutely love. And it's another one, like a beer was saying, you know, the language, you're just reading it and thinking you, you just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant stuff. Fantastic. Well, what about yourself? Up, yeah, to round off, I'm reading um, Vine Street by Dominic Nolan, which is another proof, which is out in the shops next month, and it's um, set in 1930s Soho. So it's kind of a bit a bit like kind of Peaky Blanders, but in Soho with, with, mm. um, with the um, the Vice Squad, and uh, it's kind of linked into bigger global events as well. I'm only just literally just started it, so I kind of got a handle on the plot yet, but it is shaping up to be 
disgustingly good, it must be said. So uh, that's another one to look out for. So, right, we're nearly off of time. So we should say thank you to Abia and Zamarian once again. Uh, a Shadow of Men by Abia Mukherjee is published 11th of November. So that's the fifth in the series, isn't it, Abia? So that's, uh, that's, right. that's yeah. growing. And yours is also the fifth in the series on you on uh, Marion, isn't it? Next in line. So yeah. that's, um, that's out actually from now. So people can catch up on that series ASAP. So thank you very much for tuning in. We'll be back next month with more book choices as ever. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Ben. you so much. Okay.